the uh, past season, uh, some of the harvest statistics. They'll answer the proverbial question, why aren't they announcing the brood counts anymore in the summertime? And then they'll offer up some strategy and tactics. These guys know of, of which they speak. So stick around if you're a rooster fanatic. We'll also talk about uh, one more essential item for your hunting vest in our Handle It segment. And finally, from the Facebook pages this week, have you ever been well and truly lost? I asked that question and got some fascinating answers. No, I did not get, well, maybe on the way back from the airport in Minneapolis, but that's about it. So uh, we'll be covering all of those and who, who knows what else right here on the Upland Nation podcast. You know, I'm still looking back on an incredible uh, season. Yeah, lots of chucker hunting, lots of new territory. As you know, that's kind of one of the things I love to do. And we had one spot that I'd been wanting to go to for a long time. It had been mentioned to me by a um, good friend who uh, even on a long day, he will go, you know, on a short day. He'll drive three hours each direction to hunt five hours and uh, drove past that spot on the way back from another place a while back. So I said, hey, Tom, let's go. And uh, we finally did. And uh, sure enough, at the top of the canyon, the gate was locked. Didn't stop us. We were still allowed to go in there. We just couldn't drive all the way down to the bottom of the river uh, uh, canyon where the chuckers and the quail dwelt or at least we were hoping they would so we walked down it and uh you know the usual slip and slide on the snow on the rocks but at about the halfway down point we started uh, going back up into the breaks there and uh had a good time on chuckers and um, on the way back we were uh, crossing a few wheat fields that had been harvested of course it's you know late winter for that matter and uh, son of a gun, if uh, Flick doesn't go on point in the middle of this stubble field, and it's blowing a gale, it's probably a 30 mile an hour wind up there, and it's cold, and um, he will not budge. So uh, we start humping it that way, and it's a long way off. And if you've ever walked on snow covered wheat stubble, you know what I mean. But what we found after the first covey flew is that even a little stubble is a windbreak for a little bird like a Hungarian partridge. As soon as that first bunch got up, it broke out a second bunch a little bit further downwind, and then the the pair that were hiding upwind from Flick also got out of there. We were never near them for a shot, but it was sure nice to see on that just broad, empty plain, windswept, full of Huns. It was a good year for hunts, and you know, I took a little poll at Pheasant Fest uh, for our Western hunting buddies. Uh, huns everywhere were in uh, larger numbers than most people had seen in a while. So uh, there you go. For what it's worth, we got a good holdover population, and, uh, and with luck, uh, things will uh, bode well for next season as uh, a result of that. You, of course, I, you know, from personal experience, I've had lots of this happening to me. But way back in the day, mountain man Jim Bridger said, uh, was asked, he was asked, uh, have you ever been lost? And he, his reply, he was kind of a smart ass. His reply was, uh, no, but I've been mighty confused for three or four weeks at a time. Um, so I asked that question on, on the social media uh, a few weeks ago, and I got some great answers. Michael Salamani yeah, he has the best one so far. I keep trying to get lost, but can't seem to. Lance Larson on a Mern's quail hunt, yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, GPS. Um, love it and you hate it. Don't forget to calibrate your compass. I do it on every trip just to play it safe. I've had the experts tell me every time you change area codes, is a good time to calibrate your compass. Uh, maybe that would have helped you too, Randy Gosta. Off by 180 degrees. Yeah, I remember when I learned all that about calibrating a compass, I'd called the company and said, every time I, my GPS says my dog is in front of me, he's behind me. 
All right, yeah. Uh, Glenn Ainsworth is looking at the map there, trying to suss it out. The map was an illustration in the Facebook post. He says, hey, there's some pretty good sage-grouse country on that map. It's, it's absolutely true. In most of the places on that map, uh, the units aren't open, even if you could get a permit. Jay Chaplin says, hunting in the north woods of Maine in the early 2000s, that in itself is a recipe for disaster. Took a compass reading before we entered the woods, turned on my GPS, following the dog, killing a limit of wood. You had to say, you had to, you had to rub it in too, Jay, didn't you? Kill the limit of woodcock. Heading back to the road, uh, it didn't make sense on the GPS. Uh, compass reading, even a map drew, drawn in the dirt. Oh boy. Um, whew, I'm glad you got out of there and lived to tell about it. David DeSmither says he hasn't been lost, but he too, like Jim Bridger, has been confused. Miles Burdett gets lost all the time in the city. Robert Van Hoos spent three hours exploring the upper lower peninsula. I think I know where you are then over there. He was about ready to start firing off the three shots for an SOS, but every time he shot the first time, another bird flushed. I wish I had problems like that. Listen, some great stuff there. And even if you've never been lost, you'll learn something from some of the comments. So make sure you visit the Wing Shooting USA or the uh, Upland Nation Facebook pages. It's, uh, It's always fun, and I sure appreciate the community we're creating there. Speaking of community, we'll be back to talk about the uh, community we experienced uh, at Pheasant Fest and the Quail Classic in just a few moments. First, a quick break for a couple announcements. First off, Midway USA, our newest partners here at the Upland Nation podcast, they've asked me to create a whole bunch of videos and write some articles for their pages exclusively. And A lot of those are already up. So if you want to learn anything about early puppy training, you know, just kind of a nudge to remind you, here are some things you can cover with a very, very young pup. The premise being the puppy is learning the moment it uh, it is born. And when we pick it up, it's already eight weeks into a life of learning, and we better take advantage of that. As uh, as one of my guests said recently, it's really a, a young skull full of mush that we really should work on immediately upon taking delivery. That's one of them. Uh, another bit of advice on picking a puppy. We've got all sorts of things coming up at MidwayUSA.com. And you know, They carry just about everything for shooting, hunting, and the outdoors. Go to MidwayUSA.com. We're in the mid-break, I guess, because Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School is our other sponsor today in this break. You know, they've got some of those great Negrini cases for your shotgun, and they are cool. Saw a whole bunch of those at uh, at the Negrini booth at Pheasant Fest. Thanks, guys, for being so hospitable. If you want to upgrade your shotgun experience, one way to do it is to pop your gun into a Negrini case. Learn more about them at mid valleyclays.com pretty simple if you go to that page you'll just click on the uh, online store and take a look at all those great negrini cases made in italy beautiful design and very functional so take a quick look at midvalleyclays.com So excited to be here on the floor at Pheasant Fest in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota. So what do we do? We talk to guys from South Dakota. <laughs> and Start I apologize. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna dribble off into a South Dakota accent way too often. I apologize okay. in advance. Uh, but we have two guys from the South Dakota <laughs> South Dakota Game Fish and Parks Department. 
uh, which um, we have an affinity for anyway, I'll tell right. you that off mic. Why don't you guys introduce yourselves, and then we'll just jump right in. Uh, Chris Hall, and I'm a communication specialist with Game Fish. I think I've been with the department 16 years. So you're the fish whisperer. You, you, is that the kind of communication you do? So, sort of, yeah. We, we, shout, we shout from the rooftops of everything that we're, uh, that we're doing and trying to get accomplished. Love yeah. it. And Nick? Nick Harrington, communications manager with Game Fish and Parks. Still not quite to Chris's numbers. I'm <laughs> no. only at almost five years. Yeah. But I, I want to be the fish whisperer. He can be the bird I'll whisperer. The How's that bird sound? Whisperer, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'm neither one, but I am the world's worst uh, television television shotgun shooter ah, yes. uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that so you know obviously we're at pheasant fest pheasants are on everybody's mind mm-hmm. for a whole bunch of reasons and south dakota is the place always will be um we all know populations go up populations go down how was this past season so the two, 2022 season largely it, it was really, really good. And, and you know, all your listeners, and, and Scott, of course, you know, it starts and ends with habitat. It really does. Um, I think, you know, the Pier area and, and certainly southeast South Dakota, we went into this spring with, with great hopes, but, but we're looking at dry weather and dry conditions, too. Um, so there was a little bit of hesitation, but I would say that we got some really timely rains, especially in that central part if you get west of pierce she's still pretty dry but that central part and even the southeast got some of those good good spring rains not too many of those gully washers in june yeah. that really really decimates you know some of the nesting and stuff but our populations were great and, and the hunting was great right up until right before christmas <laughs> yeah and then you got hammered i was talking yeah. to somebody out in the uh in in that neck of the woods actually now that i think about it, and he said we uh, they finally took a bobcat and knocked yep. some of the snow off some of the of cattails i'd never heard anybody do that yep. before but it seemed to work pretty well for them yeah. thank goodness nick if you were to kind of summarize uh, maybe a a four i know it's early but a uh, possible forecast and the and the and then the, the components of making a good forecast for next season which i guess would be this season this, now yep, that I right. think about it. What would you what would you put into that equation? You know, I think the first thing that we would start talking about now is the winter. And like Cole said, December, that mid-December, we started getting snow. But then the good news is, I mean, we've been in the 50 degrees in Pier the last right. couple weeks, yeah. two weeks. So I, I would say we're all a little nervous with how the, how the winter was going to start. But even it hasn't been those next one, next one, next yeah. one, which is, but if you had to pick between one event and four or five of those medium events, I'm going to take the one that we had. Uh, and, and as Chris said, that habitat, you were seeing lots of birds in that good winter cover, where okay. there's trees, where there's sloughs, where there's that good thermal cover. There are hundreds, if not thousands of birds utilizing those, those components. So that's a good start to see. We still have, what, probably another month or so still of winter in South Dakota. But then we're going to start looking at what those spring conditions look like. And, yeah. and that's, like Chris said, we're going to be looking for those timely rains. We're going to be looking for that good nesting habitat. And then that's when that peak peak nesting is going to take place about that june period and then even that late june is when we're going to start really as long as we're not getting big hails big big dumper rains that's exactly what we're looking for and again between the weather that's the first that's kind of the components i discussed there but as chris said habitat's the next component and that's something that is our our number one priority for for our department is is habitat and access and even one thing i'm really excited for just this year is our new big sioux river crep program conservation reserve enhancement program so many of folks familiar with the james river crep that has about eighty thousand acres enrolled in it right now we're along the I-29 corridor. So along that big Sioux River now, there's up, gonna be up to another 25,000 acres. That program just started in December. So I think there's a lot of lot of promise on the habitat front. So is that, it, like CRP, do you recruit and, yep. and and create a program for private landowners? Yes, sir, and then the, the E part of that, the enhanced part yeah. of it is public access. Yeah. So it's a, it's a yeah. federal, federal state partnership you know, it's a CRP federal contract, and then they're contracting with us for the access. Wow. Yeah, um, and it, to put that kind of really quality habitat in places right next to Sioux Falls, Brookings, you know, up and down that I-29 corridor is going to be a big, big deal. That's incredible. So just out of curiosity, um, uh, what's been the reception to the new the new version of this? I think, and, and Nick can speak to it too, I think 
you know, so they're going to be some different, they're based on rent, you know, rental payments. Yeah. And I think initially some of those landowners were thinking, yeah, you, you're not going to be able to pay me enough. Um, but at the same time, they're adjusted. So that's why they get smaller acres. But it's also, you got to remember, farmers want that habitat on there too, but it's got to make sense. And yeah. once they started seeing that, Oh, those rental rates are close. I think I, I don't think we're going to have much problem facing that twenty-five oh, yeah. thousand acres. But at the same time, um, there's been a big push by our twelve private land hab, uh, habitat biologists, by our conservation officers, heck, even by our, our WDM, like think trappers, to go out and contact, talk to your landowners, and go, hey, it, you know, if you're in this drainage, I think we can make this work for you. You know, that's been my gripe all along. This is my show, so I can say this. Um, we need to get closer to market rates, mm-hmm. uh, which is something that is very difficult to do when we're talking about tax dollars, right. if you will. But it, it, it's the only way to make sense for most landowners, right. isn't okay. it? Well, you guys have a great walk-in program, too, mm-hmm. here. And, and it's been, you know, we've used it to advantage in, in any number of ways. Um, if we were to talk more about public access in general and you wanted to give some tips to listeners about how to take better advantage of that what nick what would what would we do next so the number one thing i would say for folks taking advantage of those public opportunities is go to our website right now and look at our public hunting access map we we have print copies and that had been really popular in whole 16 years but up in in my last five we've had a lot of a lot of folks utilizing that online resource so they could zoom in see exactly where they want to be onyx those types of apps and maps those have been a huge huge boom even since i started four or five years ago so get in start looking at those areas now in that primary pheasant range and again it's it's the best time to start planning your trip and the other thing i'll say is you hear about those popular areas okay well the chamberlain area the pier area you hear where are the birds at where are the birds at well you can go find really good areas doing your research now right. and you're going to not have as many hunters and you're going to have less competition when you're out in the field and you're going to find some of those best hidden gems out there so this is the time to do it and then again our website's a great resource our map is a great resource and and there's plenty of other ones out there too I've always told people to uh, start early, but then some of the programs uh, are taking enrollment up until August. Yeah, I think, absolutely. aren't Correct. they? Yes, yes. Sir. So we got to we got to stay online. Yep. Because that's where you're going to get the updates, and then the the book comes out soon after that. Yeah, right. It? Early August, yeah. or mid August. About, about yeah. State Fair, which yep, is about, Labor yeah, Day weekend. Go. Yep. Yeah. So so get both. Right. And and uh, and then you're. Right. fully armed and ready to go. It, it, this show is, is interesting, Scott. I think I've done 16 of these uh, Pheasant Fests with tourism and game fishing parks. This show, especially in Minneapolis, I talk to talk to guys who give me their tricks and say they're from Bloomington or Eden Prairie or Edina. They wait all year to come to South Dakota. Yeah. Right? So they're, you know, they're at the show and they're coming they're like, yeah, we did this and we went on your website and we found the harvest rates and we looked at the counties and then we, we, we've got this formula that compares the public land <laughs> to, to the harvest rate and then there's some hunter density stuff. Like, you guys are, you guys got this down. I can't teach you anything, well, right? Yeah, so, yeah. you know, there are those tools that, yeah, you want to go and hunt those places that you have the memories at. Man, last year, those birds, we really cracked them in this area. But you got to be flexible. And if you do that homework, man, you're maximizing that time, your seven-hour drive over to, you know, wherever. You're maximizing that time and going, God, we got to be a little bit more flexible on where we're going because remember last year, here's the data. And if you're looking at weather and all the stuff, they put those pieces together and hunting smarter, you know. Yeah. Hunting smart, we know about that, you know, hunting the right cover at the right times, hunting near water if it's hot, hunting all that smarter. And those are the guys that come and go, every year we come and we have a great hunt. And those it, are the guys not to play fantasy football with. Yeah, exactly. I know, that's, that's, that's <laughs> scary. They're supposed to be fun, <laughs> right? <laughs> but it is, and it's like, you know, it's not hunting, but it's close enough. Right, <laughs> it's right. like I tell people, we're making a TV show about hunting. It, it's not hunting, but it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, you know, if you were to give give one more bit of advice about public access, um, uh, what what would it be? You know, I think the number one advice I would give to everyone listening is all these areas, whether they're walking area, whether they're chap, whether they are game production areas, 
you got to be respectful. I, I think that's the number one concern we hear is when you come in and you're and you're disrespectful to that parcel, we might lose it for all of us. It 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 could take one or two people to to just not do their part, and we all lose that opportunity. So, this has nothing to do with planning to hunt, but it's making sure that that opportunity you have is still there for years to come. So that's the number one thing I would say is be respectful where you're parking, pick up your litter, make sure you're not dumping bird carcasses in the ditch. That's going to make sure that we still have these opportunities year in and year out, and you can keep going to those honey holes too. Right. Amen to that, and that is exactly right. I'll never forget a couple years back seeing all those bad examples on one single area. Mm My first thought was, he's gone. Right. He'll never be back in the program. Right. Now, what if you're a landowner and you, you want to be more involved in some element of public access? How do you start out in that? You know, it, we've got a bunch of resources. Uh, we've got a kind of a landowner-driven um, Habitat Pays website, kind of a one-stop shop. Yeah. But we're also really putting our money where our mouth is, Where and I brought it up earlier. We have 12 private lands habitat biologists now. What was it, two years ago, Nick, we had four? Four, yep. Wow. Now we have 12 on the ground across the state. If you're interested in it at all, yeah. We've got somebody knocking on your door. You know, you don't even have to call us because uh, we're pushing the habitat and access is our number one goal. So it's from, like I said, COs, trappers, communications guys and gals, and these private lands biologists are, are coming and saying, hey, it might not work for you now, but here's my card. Here's all the information. When you start thinking about it, we want to make it work for you. We want to make it work for us. And we want to make it work for the hunter. Great. So. I'm Scott Linden. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. We're talking with Nick Harrington and Chris Hull of the South Dakota Game, Fish, and Parks Department. There was a reorganization there a few years back. Am I correct in that uh, about the time Jeff Vonk left? Yeah, that was before both your times. No, no, I was, oh, I, was okay. around Vonk. I was around for all of Vonk, yes, sir. Yeah, um, because I, maybe uh, you added Game and Fish to Park. No, Tourism. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, it, it was. That's a trivia question, right. I guess. <laughs> I, I think I think Vonk's big thing was, uh, I, you know, we were always game fishing parks, but it, there's a division there, and it's a natural division, not only just not so much activity, but funding wise. Yeah. And, and Vonk, and then Kelly Hepler, and now certainly uh, current secretary Kevin Roebling said, "Look, guys, gals, we're, we work together. Yeah, we might not be able to pay for all this stuff." out of the same pot of money but we really have to make a stress if if parks need something wildlife's got to step in if wildlife needs something and we've got parks folks we're going to make this work yeah. right and and there's always this oh di- diversion of funds and division of money and stuff no we're we're all about opportunity we're all about you know recruitment retention reactivation all these things but we also we're, we're team gfp and kevin says it all the time so that was the big stressor there. I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, I'm glad it's all settled. And, and, and before we go to break, let's talk a little bit about uh, what was a, uh, maybe a tempest in a teapot. There was a, it's been a couple seasons ago now. Uh, the, the department decided not to, either not to do them or not to make the information available on uh, what I'll loosely call uh, pheasant number forecasts am i correct is that what we were brood, brood counts, counts. Brood thank you however yes. you want to look at it yep yeah you know i've never thought that they could be possibly be very accurate anyway what do i know i'm just a music major right. <laughs> but, but what what was the driving force behind stopping that you know i think the number one thing we, we don't do those surveys anymore we, yeah. we don't do those and i i, I look back at 2019 2019, we couldn't even get down the roads that yeah. some of these roads were on. I mean, right. for as whole talked about being dry earlier, in 2019, we had water right. coming out of our ears, nose. <laughs> I mean, it was... And again, you you go back to, this is this is a good forecast tool to an extent. Again, yeah. you, you still have the human element component of it, right? I mean, this yeah. is still a human survey. But the, the fact of the matter is, I mean, this this wasn't making management decisions. This was right. simply being used as a as, as a tool, for yeah. for lack of a better word. That how how sharp a tool that was. That one again, you you've got that human element element component of it. But as far as truly making management decisions, it just it it wasn't serving. It just wasn't serving that purpose. So I was kind of right. Yeah. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> I hope everybody made a note of that. It's the yes. only time I've been right all day. Right. <laughs> 
We'll uh, take credit for that, Nick. Yeah, good. All right. Uh, speaking of taking credit, uh, we'll be back with Chris Hull and Nick Harrington in just a moment here on the Upland Nation podcast. We're on the floor of the Pheasant Fest and Quail Classic here at Pheasants Forever in Minneapolis. We'll be back in just a moment. We'll have more from the Pheasant Fest and Quail Classic coming up in just a couple moments. First, remember our Handle It segment this time around. uh, One more essential item for your vest. It was reminded, uh, I was reminded of it several times at that gathering. Uh, First off, though, truelockchokes.com is where you improve your shooting with a simple replacement of your factory chokes for some well-designed, incredibly engineered choke tubes. If you weren't at the National Wild Turkey Federation while we were at Pheasant Fest, well, there's still plenty of discounts and other deals at Truelock chokes.com everything from a free choke tube case for the right amount of money of when you buy in a few chokes to free shipping on domestic orders over 120 bucks so check it all out at truelockchokes.com now let's get on the plane and zip right back to minneapolis And welcome back. We're in the, what are we in? The Minneapolis Convention Center? Is that what that is? I'm Scott Linden, Chris Harrington. <laughs> hey, we're brothers. Hey. Do that. That's what I'm going to do from now on. Yeah, Chris Harrington. Yeah, that's we'll we'll go by moment. that. You, you got it. it. You got it right. Take it. Let's roll with it. Chris Hull, Nick Harrington, uh, both of South Dakota Game Fish and Parks. Uh, you're hunters. Yes, sir. Okay, so we're going to talk hunting for a while because this is my favorite subject. Perfect. And it's my podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so, so pheasant hunters make up 50% of, uh, of, of my listeners, 50% of them say oh. pheasants are their favorite sure. game mm-hmm. animal to pursue. Give us a hunting tip. I, I think... My, my, my biggest hunting tip, and, and I'm a fifth-generation South Dakota kid from northeast South Dakota. I grew up labs, bird dogs. I uh, didn't get to deer hunt because my dad said we're feeding dogs, so you yeah, have to be a yeah, bird yeah, hunter. Yeah. I, I think the biggest thing for me is, is, is the dogs. Um, you know, I, I see I, I hunt a lot with a lot of people from all over, and, and they're always asking dog training tips, dog training tips, and, and it's a couple things. Always follow your dog, which is the most obvious but most underutilized tip trust your dogs and then let let those dogs you know a labrador retriever has been a hunting dog for how many thousands of years don't get so heavy-handed and overtrain them right let them be the athlete and the intelligent critter even though they act like idiots most of the time let them be the intelligent critter that they are don't be heavy-handed with them when they're puppies let them have fun go out and and you're going to get a dog is as good as you are you don't have to be, and I love Tom Dock, and I've learned so much from him, but you don't have to be Tom Dock and have a good dog, right? Let them be the athletes and the brains that they are, and then hunt smarter. Know the cover. Know your cover. If it's roosting cover, hunt it later in the evenings, right? Um, if it's hot out, looking for water. If, it's, if there's a lack of food out on the, out on the landscape, looking for good cover close to, close to good food. Those are, the, those are the tips. If you do that. You're a way better hunter than 99% of the folks. So you brought up a, uh, a, an element there that uh, is a constant subject of debate at every tavern in South Dakota mm-hmm. right after shooting hours are done, and that is, what is the role of water in a pheasant's life? Are they drinking it? Are they going down to drink? Nobody, no biologist has ever been able to clear that up for me. I, every critter needs water. Yeah. Whether you're a bird or a bee or a dog. And, and I, I think it depends on the year, too. So if you have really good dew conditions, yeah. 
that right. need for water is going to be less prevalent. But Holt knows this. I know this. The last two years, July, August, into September, there were not dewy days. I mean, we were not having those. And that's when you start seeing pheasants out on the road, too, is those dewy days that they're out, they're getting the water off their wings. So when you have those dew conditions, I don't think water plays a very big component. When you don't have those dew conditions, fall, that's right. when you're start that's when you're gonna start seeing that water play more and more of a more and more of a role. Nick, you just said they're getting water off their wings. I've never, I've never heard that before. Oh, yeah. yep. You got to elaborate on that. Well, so that's why in the mornings when you're seeing when you're seeing those birds out on the roadways, that's what they're doing is they're getting out of that heavy cover and they're truly right. getting that dew conditions off their wings. Okay. And, and that's how that's how they can fly well. That's how they. Yeah. That's really yeah. their their way to start their day. I wake up, I put my contacts in. <laughs> pheasants wake up, they go in, they, they go out on the roadways or find open areas and, and yeah. get those dew okay. off their wings. Okay, so they're not drinking that. They're just getting it off yeah. their feathers. You so know, yes. Get, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A little oh, bit of grit yeah. in the yeah. mornings, and yeah. then you'll see them. They're doing this, oh, and yeah. you see yep. the water flying off of them. It, it, never absolutely. knew that's what it was yeah. for. If you see a pheasant licking its arm, that one you might want to call us, right. and we might need <laughs> to check that out. Yeah. <laughs> find out what new avian disease right. is out exactly. there. <laughs> well, well, we got a great tip from him on hunting. Nick, how about you? What I mean, if, when you're going to go out there, and, and I'm telling you, okay, take, take uh, Chris and I and yep. make sure you find a bird for us, what are you going to do? So the first thing I'm going to do, and Hull's going to laugh at me, is I'm going to put in my work beforehand. I, yeah. You know, fe February, we're here. It is February right now. We are as far away from hunting season as it can be. But you got all these people. We're going to have 20,000 people at the show making plans to go hunt. When you're in South Dakota, if you're camping, if you're fishing, go check out those areas you want to hunt. Right. See what that cover looks like. See what that landscape looks like. I mean, that's going to be that preparation to me. That's what I enjoy the most out of anything, whether that's hunting, whether mm -hmm. that's fishing. I like the prep work. I like the homework that goes into it. And take advantage of those vacations that you're here. See what's going on. And then if you can, even come a few days early and get that scouting in too. So I'm a big researcher. Now, physically, in the field, the number one thing I'm going to say is, is make sure you're having fun. I mean, that is, it, it sounds cliche, but it's not. I mean... It is all about going out and making sure you're having a, a good time, making right. sure you're hunting to the skill of everybody. If Hole's gonna Hull, if Hole's gonna take me hunting, he knows he needs to hunt to my skill level. I can't keep up with him. Yeah, okay, so right. he has to lower himself, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> significantly. And if I'm fishing with him, I got to do the same. Thing. I hear you. That's fair yeah, enough. Absolutely. Um, you, you know, you you both bring up good points, and uh, and they are doubly true when we're hunting some of the walk-in and public access areas. But there are more walk walk-in style access than than one would ever think. I just put together a list of all the places where you might access ground in South Dakota. There are some fascinating ones that are not refuges. Uh, BLM or or even the the traditional right. walk-in programs. What yep. are some of those? I, I think I think you know we talked about crep a little bit, which is it's a, which is coming around, and and we have other states going. We want to do that too, and that's a water quality based thing. Okay. But I think and Nick is looking at me, and he, I know he wants me to say chaps, which is a it's a, a walk-in style. It's private land privately owned but it's controlled access so oh. only so many people can hunt it in a day yeah whether and whether it's you know we have goose hunting chaps and we have some pheasant hunting upland chaps and deer hunting chaps those are things where you can go if you're on the ball you can get signed up on our website you go in there again do a little homework and you know nobody's walked that yeah in a day and those are yeah. really spectacular and we're, we're trying to push those a little bit more because those are a little bit different contract they get paid per hunter yes um, but those are those are quality experiences. They really are. I, I love that idea. That's kind of the Montana model. Yes, to yes, sir. To Very much with, so. Maybe you stole it from them or vice versa. I think, but, no, I think we stole it from them. Yeah, uh, but it, th that makes all the sense in the world. So that one we got to really plan in advance and yeah. and actually literally sign up right. online. And, but but you know some of those uh, you could look and and tomorrow is open. Yeah. You know I I mean we we push trying to you know be in communications guys we're trying to tell people about all these opportunities i think it's still very much an underutilized opportunity and, and each chap is different too i mean they yeah. get extremely unique and that's where that personalization component comes in to to get that land enrolled in public hunting land so some you may just be able to sign up right there it depends they might right. just be deer they might just be turkey there might be upland opportunities right. too so i think that's i think that's one but while I have the opportunity, I really like to talk about the various types of public lands. So you brought up school and public lands. Um, you brought, brought up refuges. 
when people when people are looking at true state land, game production areas, those are lands that are owned and managed by game fish and parks. Now, the walk-in area, the crep lands, those are true private lands. 80% of South Dakota is privately owned, which is why it's so important to have those 12 guys and gals in the field and all of Team GFP working to make sure that of that 80%, we're providing those access opportunities. And that's where your walk-in program comes in. That's your trap. That's, that's crep. Those types of areas, making sure we are maximizing as much of that area for people to get out and hunt as possible. And that's before you stop and take a look at other pieces of the map, whether it's Corps of Engineers, right. yep. uh, Bureau of Reclamation. There's any number of other public agencies that, that right. quite often will cut, especially up and down the river there. Right. Yep. So if you had to leave us each with one more bit of hunting advice, plumb deep into the depths of your experience and uh, give us your best tips we'll start with you hmm. chris I, I i think nick sort of touched on it and but it, it's the it's the fun it's the joy i mean we're not hunting pheasants or anything really for uh, you know to live off of you know we're going to maximize when we shoot them we're going to maximize them take care of them i think that's that's part of it to have fun but I, more and more especially i'm going to use the term kids with nick that age group that we maybe miss to recruit they're coming back because they want to know where their food is, right? Uh -huh. And so many times I get get hunters coming that shoot pheasants. Well, I'm taking them home and put them in cream cream of mushroom soup. God, don't do that. <laughs> you know, do do your research on how to cook that stuff too. And there's plenty of resources here, but learn learn how to really do those birds justice. Yeah. And it, and it adds so much more. My wife could care less if she ever shoots a pheasant again. My grandma thought, yeah, you put it in heavy cream with apples. That's a secret, oh, by yeah, the way, the is. apples. That's you know, a that good was, one, yeah. That was the only way you ever cooked it. But my wife started going, well, we can use it in white pheasant chili, and we can use it in fajitas, and we can, and it's added so much more to my family that it, it, it's really added to the enjoyment of it, too. So so do your research on the back end, too. That's that's one tip I'll give you. That's a great one, and I'm making a mental note of apples because apples, apples go great with almost every bit chop of wild Chop them up game. small, and like yeah. a Granny Smith something tart, chop yeah. them up really small, and it really brings out that pheasant taste. That's my Grandma Gladys's recipe. My dad's going to be mad at me that I shared it with you, but that's well, okay. That's all right. We won't tell. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, I guess we already <laughs> we told. We did tell. <laughs> Nick, how about you? If you had to go down down the list to something that maybe you don't get a chance to cover with most people what would it be i would say again this is going to sound cliche but whole picked on me i want to shout out for the readers i'm 26 years old so <laughs> decide so, if i'm a kid or not so a legal adult <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> i can rent a car we're fine <laughs> but i mean the number one thing i want to say is just never stop learning and, and don't if you've been hunting south dakota for 20 years don't just go to that one piece of property or two piece of property you know so many times i hear from folks well gosh i've been coming here for 15 years and the last five it's just been awful well we have we have millions of acres out there get out right. and look at them get out right. and yeah. try new things okay maybe maybe there's a new crep land right down the road that is going to be your new favorite honey hole yes. i mean I, I hear it just so much, especially at these types of shows. Wow, it's, I always hunt here, and it's all and it's been great, but now it hasn't been great for two years, or it was finally back this year. It goes back towards getting out, doing your research, and not saying this is the one way to do it. We have an abundance of opportunity in South Dakota. Get out and explore all of it, and always try something new. I even tell people when they're coming here, if this is your first trip, you have two five-day periods. Yeah. You might even do some road work. Do Huron, and then do Arlington, or maybe go to Pier, and right. then come back and do Aberdeen and Webster or Watertown. Hit a couple different areas and find where you like to hunt, the types of areas that fit to your, your style of hunting, and then you're going to find, okay, I like that area. I want to focus in on that. And even if you've been coming for 20 years, it still might be a good time to do that. And again, maybe you're going to find a new favorite spot or just break up that routine for a year or two. Nick Harrington, Chris Hull, say get out of your rut. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Enjoy South Dakota, every dimension, every corner, and I can't agree more. Guys, thanks so much for being a part of the Upland Nation podcast from Pheasants Forever, uh, Quail Classic, Minneapolis, all of the above. We'll see you in South Dakota. Yeah, thanks, thanks so for much, having guys. Us, Scott. We yep. appreciate it. Thank you, guys.
that one more essential item for your hunting vest coming up in just a moment after these quick messages first from sageandbreaker.com fred bohm dropped me a note right before i left for pheasant fest to remind you that that brand new range bag is about ready to debut at their site you don't want to miss out on that or any other new products or future sales coming down the pike so sign up for the mailing list at sageandbreaker.com that range bag looks good can't wait to get my hands on one i'll give you a full review when i do but in the meanwhile if you're looking for the ultimate heirloom quality range bag which can be used for all sorts of other things too in fact somebody called it a blind bag you could do whatever you like with that incredibly beautiful functional range bag from sage and breaker.com sign up for the mailing list and you will not miss out and got the chance to play with uh, the newest of the new pointer shotguns at the uh, pheasant fest uh, rick hankey the president of legacy sports the parent company was sharing a booth with me we had a great time good to see you again rick but also got my first look at the new case colored side by side yeah blue barrel but that breech, you know, that part down there, the case coloring, incredible. And, you know, the wood is always really nice, especially for the price. And that's the whole point of this. It got a lot of attention out there. Pointershotguns.com is where you learn more about both of those, um, both the 12 and the 20 gauge coming down the pike and everything else they're putting out there. You know, a lot of interest in the uh, semi-automatics as well from Pointer Shotguns. So find a nearby retailer browse the models watch some of my videos and articles are available there at pointershotguns.com well when i wasn't cutting uh, uh podcast interviews at the pointer shotgun booth i was talking to you and you and you and thank you all for stopping had a great it was kind of like a high school reunion even if you didn't go to any and that would be me I was playing music at the time. I always had to play music at somebody else's reunion, I guess. Anyway, um, heard a ton of stories about, uh, well, first off, a whole bunch of porcupine stories, and I'm glad to have helped. You know, a couple of those folks said they learned something from a video or an article, and I'm glad to have help on that. But also a lot of stories about snares. And I remembered Terry Wilson's advice. Terry is over there at Ugly Dog Hunting Company. And Terry reminded me that sometimes a good set of side cutters isn't enough to cut that cable. If your dog gets caught in a snare. And luckily all the stories had happy endings this time around. So that's great. I like to carry something that will cut just about anything short of the transatlantic cable. Uh, go on uh, one of your favorite uh, websites or go down to your favorite hardware store and get bona fide aircraft cable cutters. Not cheap, but what's your dog's life worth? Buy yourself a real pair of aircraft cable cutters. The best investment you'll never use, I hope. Good luck on that. Put that in your vest. I carry them. They probably weigh 8 ounces max. And uh, there will come a time, whether it's your dog or somebody else's, when that's what you need most. Can't thank you enough if you stopped by and said hello at Pheasant Fest. Thanks for all the free beer, everybody. Sure appreciate that as well. Enjoyed the heck out of getting to know you all better. New friends, old friends. It was a great Pheasant Fest and Quail Classic, and it's because of people like you who come down there, pay your admission, join Pheasant Fest, join Pheasants Forever, a Quail Forever, and come to the Pheasant Fest. Thank you all for seeking me out and visiting if you commented at the social platforms well maybe you became slightly famous today if not uh, i did learn something and so did somebody else thanks to all of those who left ratings and reviews and thank you to our sponsors we're made possible by sage and breaker gun care products pointer shotguns mid-valley clays and true lock chokes and find birdhuntingspots.com well, uh, we don't have a pheasant fest coming up, so I can't say I'll see you at one of those, but I will see you at the range or a training day. I'm Scott Linden. 
Thanks for listening to the Upland Nation podcast.